My name is Katie and I am with Climate Classes, which is a growing local group that helps people to live sustainable lifestyles by empowering individuals with the skills in order to do so. Climate Classes is also a group that supports the Black Lives Matter movement and is committed to supporting Black, Indigenous, and peoples of color as we all learn to grow and live sustainably. I am here today with my friend, Thomas Wheat. We are at the PR Harris Food Hub in Ward 8, and he's been so gracious to welcome us in and to agree to give us a tour of this very, very cool facility. So yeah. Thomas, I'm gonna let you take it away. Awesome, thanks so much, Katie, for coming down. So we're at the PR Harris Food Hub in Anacostia, as Katie mentioned. Uh, it's a 5,000 square foot hydroponic and aquaponic facility where we collect data to try to assess the business viability of a small scale food production site like this and then distribute food to the community. This is a historic food desert. And so it's really important to try to give people around here access to fresh vegetables and fruits that they may not otherwise be able to get their hands on. So this is currently in Ward 8. Mm -hmm. Are there other facilities that are like this in other parts of DC or is this kind of a really unique project going on here? Yeah, so this is one of five food hubs that UDC, the University of the District of Columbia has. So there are several dispersed throughout the city, but for the most part, controlled environment ag, which is what hydroponics and aquaponics are a part of, it's kind of a new industry. So there's not a lot of stuff happening across the country, not a lot happening in DC. So that's a lot of what this project is about, is kind of proving this model of growing is a viable option in terms of trying to fill people's nutrient voids. That's awesome. So start here, but go anywhere. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Proof of concept. And then we kind of expand from here. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, are the, you know, out of curiosity, are the other gardens like this, are they located in other food deserts or are you also experimenting in other places where say there might be a Whole Foods or Giant down mm -hmm. the street. So for our project, most of them are in food deserts. There are a couple that are just, you know, in terms of site selection or in other parts that have access to fresh foods. But for the most part, again, we're trying to grow in communities that, that normally wouldn't have access to this, these types of resources. So it's important not only to provide nutrients and nutrient dense foods, but also the spin off kind of educational opportunities, the job skills trainings that kind of all are a part of this budding industry are kind of how we target where we put these farms. That's awesome. And by any chance, have you started to contract with local businesses or would that be an eventual goal that these food hubs are growing the food that is going directly into restaurants and not only grocery stores, but yeah. also schools as well, for example? For sure, yeah. So that, that's the ultimate goal. Right now, as a government employee, the site is, is government uh, run, so we can't really sell stuff. We're still trying to navigate that kind of process. But ultimately, yeah, the idea is to be able to grow in my opinion, all food or all produce consumed in D.C. in D.C. It'll take some work to get to that point, but that's ultimately what I'm trying to work towards. That's fantastic. I cannot wait for this tour. I'm excited. All right, let's get, let's started. get going. <laughs> we hopped over to the hydroponic greenhouse real quick just so we can kind of check out how the seeds and the plants get started. This is the beginning of their journey. So we're right by the seedling bench. These are 200 count slabs of rock wool, which is what we seed our seeds into. Okay. This is soilless systems, so there's no dirt involved. The seeds themselves get planted out into the rock wool. They stay in the seedling bench for about a week or so, depending on the season. And then when they're a little bit more mature, like this, then we actually transplant them into the system. They're in the system then for about four weeks. So from seed to harvest, it's about five weeks in terms of a turnaround for leafy greens. Wow, okay, so first of all, you just told me that all of this is done without soil or dirt or anything like that? Crazy, yeah. <laughs> okay, so so what what are these seedlings um, relying on? Is, is it something in the rock wool? No, so yeah, plants actually don't need soil, again, right? All they need is water and nutrients. Okay. So we'll show it in the other hoop house, but basically there's nutrient-rich water that's circulating to the root zone continuously in these soil systems, and the rock wool is just a medium for the roots to kind of immerse themselves in. So something to kind of grab onto, and then just nutrient-rich water cycling to the root zones is all the plants actually need to grow. That's awesome. So you, you said they're in this for about a week. Mm -hmm. How do you know when they're ready to transfer over? Yeah, it's kind of a sight thing. Basically just being able to view what has sprouted is just optically, again, knowing that this stuff is good to go. Again, with that time frame of about a week also, I have everything dated so I know when stuff was seeded and so then I know when it should kind of come out. But sometimes things take a little bit longer, sometimes they take a little bit shorter period of time. So it's kind of being able to read the plants, see when they have started to germinate like this. And then at any point once they're this big or even actually a little bit smaller, they're good to get transplanted into the system. Awesome. And, and then you also said, so it's about a week for them to seed and then you said it's about 
five weeks until harvest, which mm -hmm. I'm very used to hearing about a much longer growing mm -hmm. season. Mm -hmm. Is that because of the hydroponics system or is there something about traditional growing that um, makes it last much longer? Yeah, so a lot of it's the controlled environment that we're in. Okay. So being able to control the humidity, the temperature, the air quality, the water hitting the root zone directly and giving the plants all the nutrients that they actually need speeds up that process a bit. That five week time frame is also pertaining to leafy greens. So for more sophisticated crops like tomatoes, like we have, um, they take a little bit longer, peppers take a little bit longer, but for leafy greens, for basils, for those types of varieties, for lettuces, that five week turnaround is, is, is pretty quick. And that's standard for greenhouses. It's a bit shorter than in soil farmers would take to grow the same crop. That's awesome. Well, I can't wait to see how the actual hydroponic, and I heard that we might also get to see the aquaponic part of it, yep. uh, works. So cool. let's go over there. So we're gonna look at some of the varieties that we're growing. These are NFTs, stands for Nutrient Film Technique or Nutrient Flow Technique. They're just grow gutters that have those individual plants like what we were talking about before, okay. transplanted now into the system. So these are those baby seedlings exactly. and you've brought them over here. So now this is kind of the more mature stage and this is the system they will grow in until they're ready to get harvested. Same rock wool, each individual plant is, is kind of broken up and placed in each one of these holes. Like what we were speaking about before, plants don't actually need soil, just that nutrient rich water. So the nutrient rich water actually gets pumped to the plants and it hits the root zones. That's awesome. Yeah, so that is just cycling continuously. It's a closed loop system. And so the nutrient rich water will go down to the roots and then it'll get recycled back and just keep on going like that. If we're talking about like a, a hydroponic mm -hmm, system, mm -hmm. does it need to get cleaned before the water goes back through? Or can you explain a little bit about how the water ends up with the nutrients that goes through and then the system that, that kind of brings it back to the plants again? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. most of the nutrients are extracted by the plants, but there are also kind of filtration processes that you do to make sure that you know you have like good water always staying in the system. You can also flush a system periodically. So there's a lot of ways to you know make sure that the water quality is up to standard. But for the most part, it just ends up kind of doing its thing and just cycling back and forth from start to finish and just staying in that closed loop. So I know the plants take the nutrients out of the water. Mm -hmm. What puts the nutrients into the water? So for hydroponics, we utilize uh, synthetic nutrients. So it's NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, that okay. gets added. Those are kind of macronutrients. Uh, for aquaponics, and we'll talk about the aquaponic component of this greenhouse in a little bit, that's actually utilizing fish waste as the nutrient source. So okay. depending on which system you're talking about, they get nutrients either synthetically or naturally with fish but it's the same nutrients that then hit the same root zones that then grow the same crops. So this looks like it's one way to grow, but mm -hmm. this looks a little bit different. Can you tell me about this? For sure, yeah. So these are called Dutch buckets, and they're just a little bit bigger in terms of providing space for deeper rooting crops. So over here, we're growing okra, sweet peppers, and varieties of hot peppers as well. And again, in the, in the deep Dutch bucket system, you can imagine that an okra plant this tall would kind of topple over in an NFT like that. It just doesn't have enough root zone to kind of develop. But it really is a matter of just kind of knowing what you're going to grow and then designing and catering your system to be able to fit the crops that you ultimately want to be able to distribute. All they need is nutrients and water. As long as you're giving them exactly what they want, they'll be able to flourish. Hydroponics seem really cool, but I really want to hear about this whole thing where we incorporate fish in with the aquaponics. System. For sure, let's do it. This is the aquaponic component of the greenhouse. Each one of these tanks are 200 gallon tanks that would have fish in them that provide the nutrients to the plants. The fish produce waste. That waste gets broken down and then that nutrient rich water gets pumped to the plants. The plants then take the nutrients out of the water and in doing so, they clean the water. That clean water gets pumped back to the fish tank. So again, it's a closed loop system. We use about 90% less water than traditional farming for the same square footage. What do the fish eat in the cycle? The fish, we use uh, a organic fish feed try to make sure that we're providing high quality feed to our fish to maintain that high quality standard. So then when the fish move in, do they stay here forever or do the fish also become part of the grocery or food cycle for the community? Companies now kind of use the fish only as that powerhouse, that workhorse, but the fish are actually another revenue stream and product that a facility like this can distribute. So we're in a food desert, providing vegetables and fruits is really important. If you can add sustainably grown protein as well, now you're really 
really starting to flesh out what individuals in this community have access to. I've noticed as we've been walking through, there are some bugs, but mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was wondering, you know, have you introduced any sort of pollinators mm -hmm. or are there other sort of bugs that are allowed to live on and around the plants? And if mm -hmm. not, do you try and use any sort of pesticides? To answer that last question, we don't use any pesticides okay. at all. We do, so we have a pretty expansive IPM, which is Integrated Pest Management Program down here. So we spray things like neem oil on our crops, but I try not to use any chemicals whatsoever. Uh, we do use beneficial pests. So in many ways, I'm trying to have as diverse of an ecosystem in here as possible, which means that if you have pests that can injure or damage the crop, you also have beneficial pests like ladybugs or praying mantises that can also eat those bugs and, and kind of create this holistic system. Part of that though is because we're government funded and this is research based. If I lose a crop or two or 10, it doesn't actually affect my bottom line. The reason why a lot of farmers would use pesticides is because those 10 plants are actually impacting their revenue generation. Yeah. Uh, but I try to do things as naturally as possible. So really mi mitigating the chemical usage and really upping the beneficial pests in that interplay. And pests are a reality. One of the trade-offs of having you know, no pesticides is there will be pests. There are some choices that we, we as consumers and we as growers have to make. And I've decided that I'd rather be organic than have the most pristine, pest-free environment possible. I heard that there's maybe some other crops in the other building. Oh, okay. Check it out. Now we're back in the hydroponic greenhouse. We wanted to show both some of the other configurations for the NFTs and then also some other varieties of crops that we grow. So I guess we'll start over here. We grow three different types of cherry tomatoes and cucumbers as well. So this hoop house is where we focus on our vine crops. And you'll see that the tomatoes are trellised up at the top of that trellis wire. And we actually kind of lower and rotate the crops so they think they're growing vertically, but in reality, they're actually getting wrapped around. And what that does is allow the plant to continuously grow while also kind of maintaining a nice area for an individual to work, harvest, not have to get 40 feet up in the air like these vines would want them to naturally. Wow, so so when, when you actually harvest, mm -hmm. you're bringing them down, mm -hmm. you're, you're just lowering them so that people can access them and then you just bring them right back up so that they can continue growing at the pace they're going. A little bit, yeah. Okay. So we actually, there's when you bring them down, that lowering process is just one step. You never put them back up. Oh. So the lowering is just, yeah, to keep maintain them basically below that trellis length is okay. where you're trying to go. But yeah, once you harvest them, you lower them and then they'll maintain and then they will grow and then you'll lower them again and then they'll grow up and you'll lower them again. At any yeah. point, do you ever cut them down or cut them back? Industry standard is about 270 days or so of growth. We're kind of getting close to that period. I might let these go through the winter. So there will be a moment where we do kind of remove these plants and it just has to do with them dropping out of their peak productivity levels. Continuously throughout the growing process, you're always pruning and suckering, which is a process where you're basically cutting off branches that actually would turn into other vines. So this vine in the wild wants to just spread out and take over. We don't want that to happen because it would be a jungle in here. So you're always maintaining the crops and then eventually you do have to remove them out and then put a new, like fresh class, if you will, of tomatoes in here for new tomatoes again. How many pieces of fruit or vegetation do you get off of any of these vines? Our target is about a pound of tomatoes per plant per week. But so we have 240 tomato plants in here. So we're talking 240 pounds of tomatoes per week is what we're looking to do. We're probably about half of that right now. So probably more like 120 per week. Pretty good amount of uh, production from not a lot of plants. And again, in 2,500 square feet on what used to be a tennis court. I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could I sample a tomato? Please, yeah, of course. All right. Is, is this the yeah, one that I would that's pick? that's a good looking okay. one. Yeah, there you go. All right. Oh my goodness. It's not bad, right? It's so good. <laughs> that's really, really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a super sweet. So I try to grow varieties that are tasty or really sweet. A lot of how we grow nowadays has to do with durability because we ship produce so far. So nutrient density and taste kind of falls to the wayside and basically the ability to survive that 30 to 2200 mile trip is prioritized. So these may not hold up in a you know shipping container from California. They might get bruised, they might get split, and then the, ultimately the farmer loses money. But since we have such a short distance from farm to table, we're able to prioritize that taste and get that reaction that you just had. Wow. 
Wow. You can have another. Exactly. You're allowed to have another. I, <laughs> probably afterwards. Don't okay. worry, I brought a Tupperware. Nice, so nice. We're, good. we're good, we're good, yeah. And, um, and yeah, and so, so here we have vines over here. It kind of looks like a very similar system to what we had um, in the aquaponic uh, greenhouse. Could you explain this system to me and how it might be different? So these are similar NFTs. Okay. So there's that nutrient-rich water just cycling to the root zone, like what we saw in the other hoop house. The difference is these are on what's called A-frames. So we're actually incorporating verticality in this system. So what that allows you to do is obviously grow more plants per square foot. You can grow more in a cubic foot than you can in a square foot. So by utilizing vertical potential, you're able to compact the density of crops per square foot and therefore have a higher production level. Thomas, thanks so much for taking us through here. This is these greenhouses, both the hydroponic and the aquaponic um, houses are really incredible. And I can't wait to see how this continues to blossom and grow and how it uh, very positively, it seems, um, impact Ward 8 and all other neighborhoods in DC. And I hope that's sooner rather than later. Hopefully, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I really, I think I had a total spiritual experience while I was um, in there eating probably far too many of your tomatoes. <laughs> um, but I was wondering, do you ever have any need for volunteers? And if so, is there, how can people sign up and get involved? We do have volunteer opportunities. The best thing to do would be to reach out to my email address. We also have an Instagram if people want to follow the farm as well. And then when volunteer opportunities do open up, we'll make sure to notify people. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Thanks so much for coming down. This oh, is well. awesome. There you go. <laughs> It's a really state of the art greenhouse, you know. For sure. Yeah. Used to be a tennis court. Exactly, right?